Hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Welcome to our the Sustainable Mail Group's Plastics Roadmap launch. Uh, my name is Andrew Gustin. I think a lot of you know who I am um, from past conversations. If you if you haven't, uh, so just some minor housekeeping details before we end up actually getting into the meat of the actual presentation. The calls scheduled from two to three p.m. Um, I think if you caught it uh, early on, we're actually going to be recording this session and it'll be available uh, later on if you've missed something or if you want to share the presentation with any of your colleagues. Um, we won't be taking any questions during the actual session, but we will allow for people to, to put them in the Q&A or the chat and we'll cover off on them after the fact. Um, and uh, if you haven't done so already, I strongly recommend subscribing to our YouTube channel where virtually every of all, all of our previous seminars have ended up being hosted. Um, and ultimately, and finally, if you haven't joined the Sustainable Mail Group, you're not a member, um, please consider joining us. Um, the link to the membership link is in the uh, chat right now. And um, you can end up leaving anything there. Uh, sorry, I just got a message from somebody telling me that the chat is disabled. Okay, we'll try to fix that in the meantime. Um, where was I? Right. So maybe to start off, we can get a get a quick introduction from our panelists and our participants. So, folks on the screen right now, if you just take a couple of minutes to introduce yourselves. Hello, I, I'll start if that's okay. Um, Paul and Kevin, my name is Eleanor Raptor. I'm the director of Smart Mail Marketing um, Channels at Canada Post. Um, one of my responsibilities is uh, supporting our data products and services that support, um, you know, Smart Mail Marketing products. And the other is I also support um, the ESG, um, in particular, the environment aspect of all things related to mail and parcels at Canada Post. And I'm delighted to be here. I've been in the industry for many, many years. And, um, you know, print and mail has very is very near and dear to my heart. And um, I've worked closely with the industry through the partner program for about a decade. So I'm um, delighted that I had the opportunity here to talk about some of the work we're doing around sustainable mail. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Eleanor. Paul? Yeah, good afternoon. Good morning. Uh, Paul Shorthouse. I'm a senior director with the Canada Plastics Pact, and I have been supporting the pack now for a couple of years. I was the interim managing director for some time. I continue to uh, work with our flexibles and films working group, and I will share a little bit more about our, our work uh, across the pact. We have over 100 um, partners and members across our, our network. Thanks, Paul. Kevin, do you want to do a quick intro there? Sure, I'll do a very quick intro. My name is Kevin Song, and I work with Eleanor on the Smart Mail Marketing Channels team. Um, I'm quite new to the um, sustainable mail side of uh, the portfolio, but certainly not new to um, Smart Mail Marketing, and I'm looking forward to um, just learning and just sharing everything about the roadmap today. Thank you. Um, sorry, I'm just getting some text messages from people telling me that somehow the chat is disabled, so apologies there. Um, if you've got any specific questions, um, just email them to me at Andrew Gustin, and I'll give you the email um, shortly. Andrew Gustin at sustainablemailgroup.ca, and I'll make sure that we end up getting them to getting to them. Um, so uh, what I wanted to do now is just give everybody a quick overview of what we're going to cover today. Um, specifically the acknowledgements um, for the folks who participated in in pulling this whole thing together because this was really not a, a one group effort. Um, then we'll get into you know the why of what we're doing here um, and get some specific and and a lot of you know input from from Eleanor and specifically Canada Post as to you know what the rationale was to drive towards this roadmap. Uh, the what, um, Paul, you know, I'm hoping that you can provide us a bit of a background on what the CPP does and specifically um, related to the golden design rules, which we use as foundational elements to develop the roadmap. Then we'll get into the plastics roadmap and some of the resources. And and hopefully if you're emailing me, uh, andrew.gustin at sustainablemailgroup.ca, 
um, we can get to the questions. Um, so as I, as I mentioned before, um, this was not a, a singular effort. There are a lot of people who are involved in this whole process and, and I need to acknowledge their efforts. Um, the folks at Canada Post from the ASG teams, from the actual business unit teams, um, you know, they were, they were great resources to help us get to there. The stakeholders, um, we had a lot of stakeholder consultations through this. Um, to, to, to both vet what we were presenting and also to get some real life um, scenarios as well as some of the case studies that we've actually posted it up on our website. And then a vetting team um, ranging from folks like Charles David Mathieu Poulin who sits on our board, um, but then folks from like Re uh, Sam Baker at Recycle BC, Chris Van Rossum, yourself, Paul, and Cher Merriweather, who's the executive director or managing director at CPP. Um, you know, all of those folks were were vital in getting us to this finish line. And this has, you know, taken quite a bit of time to get there. There was a lot of vetting involved and we needed to end up building the resources to to enable us uh, to, to get to this point itself. Um, moving on in terms of the why, um, you know, we're not here and, and the premise behind this wasn't to demonize plastics by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, they serve a purpose. I mean, they're, they're you know, a reasonably inexpensive solution um, to, to contain, to provide security, to weatherproof. Um, and they're a lightweight material, right? So they're, they're a really good solution in a lot of cases. Um, you know, the issue that we end up facing, and it's something that, you know, a lot of people have likely, you know, encountered, is that we have a we have a plastic waste problem, a waste problem specifically. And you know, the 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 citation we have here is directly off of the CPP site. I think that's correct, Paul. Um, so there's an estimate right now that there's 3 million tons of plastic waste that ends up either in landfills, escapes into the environment or ends up being incinerated. And we took it upon ourselves to you know, start creating um, a, a series of pathways that people can end up embarking on that will demonstrate to decision makers, um, direct mail users, um, you know, the public as a whole that you know we can be used viewed as leaders rather than laggards, and you know, hopefully through that, what ends up resulting is is that you know through the creation of the pathway, we can actually end up starting to manipulate or drive the direction um, around legislation and where the industry ends up going. Eleanor, do you want to get into, before we kind of get into the how, you know, maybe provide us some insight around, you know, what's, you know, drove Canada Post to help, you know, push us in this direction? Yes. Um, thanks, Andrew. So um, we've been on a bit of a journey, um, in particular, as it relates to plastics and, um, and mail. And as um, I'm hoping most of you know, you know, Canada Post is committed to delivering a more sustainable future for Canadian and businesses. Um, and by exploring new ways to reduce the environmental, in, environmental impact, and that's been a mandate. And that is something that over the last couple of years, our executives have um, really put it upon us to start looking at all of our products and services and, you know, how we can ensure, whether it's through product design or development or specifications, that we're all we're doing all we can to reduce our environmental impact. And that really the impetus to all of that came from, you know, we, we have lots of um, outreach to Canadians um, and to businesses to really understand, you know, what their expectations are of Canada Post. And and that has understanding these expectations has really driven us to action in terms of things that we can do to um our within the organization and outside the organization to support in terms of ensuring a kind of more environmental and sustainable future so today um i'm happy to share some of the details of our upcoming um specification change to neighborhood mail and um, this is something that we've been working on for the last couple of years it was grounded in analysis in terms of really understanding where we have the biggest impact and the change will be implemented as of the 30th, 30th of June, 2025. So um, that date, we were actually hoping to start in January, but in consultation with the industry um, um, where we felt we needed more time, we've kind of pushed it out to mid next year. 
But before I get into the details of it, um, you know, this began by saying to Canadians, um, what or understand their perspective of plastic and the mail. Like what is the relationship of those flyers they receive, for example, um, when it comes into their mailbox, and what is their um perception of of the environment and mail in general? And just throw out a couple of stats because you know I think stats and insight really kind of support our position, but it's 38% of Canadians um, who report they never open and read mail wrapped in plastic said that they would consider reading it if not wrapped in plastic. So one of the things that we, we look at is um, the value of mail to the marketers. So the paying customer, they're getting value out of their mail and the value to the consumer. In this case, they're basically saying if it's wrapped in plastic, we don't read it. So that's, that's basically sending a mail piece to a to a household where it doesn't deliver on its promise, and that's um, to deliver content or material or advertising to that, that household. Another stat that we found was that 44% of Canadians agree that the mail they receive has a negative impact on the environment. So 44%, that's a pretty substantial number, um, where they they agree that the mail they receive has, has that negative environment um, impact on the environment. So we took that feedback and along with lots of conversation with marketers in general and um, and some other work when we look globally across um, you know other posts in terms of what they were doing um, to address the environmental impact and, and plastic kept coming back as one of the concerns. But as Andrew said just earlier, like it has been in the mail stream for years because of its protective um, qualities and inexpensive um, price point. Um, but there are that negative impacts um, and we see it, I think, in the media, you hear, you know, inevitably how the pollution that, you know, plastic makes its way into the into the um, waterways. And that's that is stats that we're seeing and um, research that's been presented globally um, as it relates to to plastics. But we also know that it, it has, as, as we say, it does have some some good qualities and, and there's it's not necessarily that we're going to be suggesting that plastic used to deliver mail to our facilities. And we all know we use shrink wrap or, or stretch film. Like that is, there's good reason that that's used from um, safety reasons to efficiencies. So we're not talking about the production process where that's used to deliver um, mail to Canada Post. It's the mail that's going into the household. So it's that piece. So I just want to be clear on what it is and what it isn't. Um, and it's not talking about um, our transactional mail. It's not talking about personalized mail. We are focusing in on neighborhood mail. And the reason we focused on neighborhood mail is because 74% of all encased plastic um, is for that product. It is for the flyers. And um, if we can solve for that one, we're solving for the biggest part of um, concern with um, Canadians and with our marketers. If we were to eliminate, and that's what we're, um, our specs will do as of the end of June 2025, we're no longer going to accept neighborhood mail items wrapped in plastic at Canada Post in our mail stream. That will eliminate approximately 200 million pieces of encased plastic a year, or about 744 metric tons of plastic. Um, it has, you know, we didn't take this lightly. Um, as you mentioned, we we went to the Sustainable Mail Group and out to some of our key partners to really talk about what would be the impact on the business, what would it take to do to be able to look at innovation, like how can innovation help us, you know, deliver a product or flyers to households um, where you don't have to use plastic, for example. And one example of that, and I'm sure there'll be many more to come, but um, DRMG, um, they committed, and this was part of our Insight magazines that I hope um, everyone on the call has had access to, um, but through their commitment um, to drive for a more sustainable um, product in their shared media space, um, they eliminate, eliminated 147,000 pounds of plastic in the mail stream and removed over 20 million plastic wraps from the market. So that's just one example of, you know, when you have partners who are looking at new and, and innovative ways. And I know there are many other partners out there who are investing in new technologies or systems or processes um, 
to to meet this objective of not having plastic wrapped or neighborhood mail items wrapped in plastic. Um, I know we can do it as an industry and it'll only, you know, better, I think the industry, it'll have a better perception in terms of what consumers, how they interact and the behave around our, um, our smart mail marketing products or our mail products. So I just want to take the opportunity to thank everybody for, um, you know, all of the support as, as Andrew said, there was a, a host of people that came along on this journey to help make this decision. Um, if you have any other ideas, one of the things that stood out to me too was the um the ability for the conversation around the community and um, where your people were willing to share their experiences or willing to share new innovations or ideas and i think you know that just benefits all of us benefits the industry and um you know benefits for a better planet going forward thank you andrew thanks eleanor um so let's let's get into you know the 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 how um and you know when we ended up consulting all of these stakeholders you know one of the things that ended up coming up with uh can't coming out of this was is that we needed to be able to provide people a series of options that are almost anybody you know within the stakeholder group would be able to end up adopting depending either on the 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 cost tolerance that they had or their ability to adopt change and you know from that perspective it was you know how resistant might their customers ultimately end up being to to look at things differently um and we needed to ensure that at least the stakeholders that we were dealing with which we you know think were a pretty broadly based uh, collection of people who participate in the mail industry um, felt that they could end up buying in. And, and, I, and I think we got there. Um, you know, the, 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 the other thing was is that um, I didn't think, and I don't, you know, from consultations with all of our team, it didn't make a lot of sense for us to be, you know, writing um, or going down a path that was independent of what other people were doing within other segments of the economy. And we're very fortunate in being able to participate as implementation partners to the Canada Plastics Pact. And um, when the CPP and the Consumer Goods Forum launched the golden design rules, we were, you know, very um, quickly latched onto them and looked at ways by and means by which we could actually, you know, adapt um, some of the golden design rules, specifically as they relate to direct mail, um, where, you know, invariably, I would say 99 to 100% of the plastic materials that you'll end up, you know, encountering are flexibles, um, rather than things like in the other in the other plastics economy, which would might be like rigid containers, things like um, you know, detergent bottles, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and another element that we tore out of the out of the CPP playbook was just to support, you know, any one of the options that we were be able to provide with, you know, case studies, real life examples that are already being implemented um, so that they could have an example of somebody who's actually done this rather than it being kind of a pie in the sky, you know, airy fairy, you know, conclusion that was difficult to implement. And so I want to turn to Paul Shorthouse and Paul um, had, was, was, you know, principal in helping us get to this point. And, and I want him to give you folks a, a better understanding as to who the CPP is, and in particular, what the golden design rules are all about. Paul, do you want to, I'll, I'll advance the slides for you if that's okay. Sure. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and thanks for having me here to share a little bit more about CPP and the Golden Design Rules. Uh, just to say CPP is an initiative of Generate Canada, which is actually a not-for-profit charity here in Canada. The Canada Plastics Pact is its own sort of initiative under that umbrella of Generate Canada with its own uh, independent sort of board of directors and a, a strategic advisory committee and, uh, and a number of different uh, projects and work streams, which I'll share just briefly a little bit more about. But we're, really, we're aligned with a number of packs around the world. There's a, a dozen and uh, plastic packs that all are under the umbrella of the Ellen MacArthur Foundation's New Plastics Economy Framework. Uh, so a lot of harmonization and effort globally to move towards a more circular plastics economy, uh, not just in Canada, but internationally and where we can align and uh, find synergies to work with the other packs. We do a lot of that together. So if you go to the next slide, just to say that uh, we're focused on leading Canada's response to sort of the escalating plastic crisis 
we were launched in uh, 2021 and really focused uh, through sort of the opportunities to foster innovation and collaboration with over 105 partners across the plastics value chain, really taking meaningful steps to eliminate unnecessary and problematic plastics, redesign packaging, and increase their use of recycled um, content within their packaging. So uh, if you go to the next slide, to say we're sort of um, working around, actually, is there a uh, working around sort of four ambitious target areas, which a lot of the, the packs have all aligned around as well. And this work is uh, essentially guiding our roadmap to 2035 and with some shorter term milestones in there. We're working to bring all the right people together from across the value chain, be a catalyst for sort of real world ideas and innovation uh, and scaling the ones that work and, and using data and science based principles to really accelerate the elimination of plastic waste. And like I like, uh, like Andrew said, we're not looking to eliminate plastic. It's about how do we keep it uh, in use and within the economy and out of the environment and out of people and animals. So uh, we also work a lot with government to help um, inform policy and incentives and to drive the business case for a circular plastics economy by removing some of the economic barriers for getting there. Um, and these targets really are, are, you know, from downstream through to reclaiming materials uh, across the value chain. So if you go to the next slide, just briefly to say we have that diversity of partners from right across the value chain, whether they're um, resin producers, manufacturers, converters, uh, brand owners, uh, to the actual recyclers, retailers, uh, and the industry associations and, and groups in between, as well as some of the academic and standards bodies like CSA group. And then uh, we organize ourselves, if you go to the next slide, around working groups. And this is how we get the work done under the, the roadmap for the CPP. And so we have sp those specific four sort of target areas and a number of sub areas of work, but the actual activities get done through these different working groups, which are structured with our, our, our partners at the table to actually uh, work on everything from redesigning packaging. And that's where sort of the golden design rules come in as some common guidance to uh, flexible packaging and thinking about how to manage flexible packaging from design through to uh, recapture and, and uh, returning it back into to new, new, new materials, to policy and infrastructure. Um, we're also looking at, uh, at reuse as a key kind of model. Uh, and we are, like I mentioned, uh, informed by good data and do a lot of research to help inform sort of the data, data situation in Canada. And we share that through sort of our knowledge center working group. So just to say that lots of work underway and uh, we're now, you know, three, three and a half years in and have learned a lot by doing. Um, and one of the guiding principles that we brought to the, the Canadian context a couple of years ago were the golden design rules, which if you go to the next slide uh, and maybe one more, I'll just share a little bit more about the GDRs. Um, they were developed by the Consumer Goods Forum's Plastic Waste Coalition and uh, the CGF, if you're not familiar with it, brings together the CEOs and senior leaders from more than 400 retailers and manufacturers across 70 countries. Um, these are companies with a combined annual revenue of 4.5 trillion. So these are major market movers. And when you start to uh, kind of get these major market movers uh, aligning around how to redesign their packaging to make it more circular or to make it more a design for recyclability, um, you start to see changes quickly within the market space. Uh, really, CPP was the one who worked to bring the GDRs to Canada in April of 2022, and we did modify them slightly for the local market realities, and we continue to sort of review and revisit the, the GDRs to make sure that they are a good fit for the Canadian context, but uh, as much as possible, we've aligned and harmonized with the, the international framework there. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see that there are sort of nine category areas for the golden design rules, which really aim to change how packaging is designed in the first place. Um, they're voluntary, so people commit to um, adopting as many of them as possible. And we encourage our CPP partners that sign on to align with the GDRs and we provide support and workshops and training and other things to our CPP partners to advance and, and align with as many of these nine golden design rules as possible. Um, and uh, really this framework is designed to drive innovation. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see how it sort of maps to some of the, the system change objectives, 
whether it's eliminating problematic or unnecessary packaging, there's three golden design rules related to that, like eliminating headspace and reducing plastic overwraps or eliminating problematic elements. Um, second objective around increasing the value of recycled materials and recycling at scale within the system. And that's how we, that's for packaging that already has uh, a good set of infrastructure in place, but it's to increase the value of things like PET or there's a the value of, uh, of rigid um, HDP or polypropylene. Um, the third is around increasing the value for future recycling systems for packaging that does not re um, have recycling at scale today. And that's where uh, flexible packaging and films come in. And so really trying to increase the value of consumer flexible packaging by aligning with guidance around sort of converting to more mono material structures. Um, as well as increasing recycling value for PET trays, and then uh, improving the environmental performance in the B2B business to business packaging space and reducing virgin plastic. And lastly, some uh, uh, around sort of labeling and, and instructions for on pack um, packaging. So those are sort of the nine golden design rules and how they map to some of the, you know, their overall objectives. And just to wrap up by saying, uh, if you go to the, the next slide here, that we've seen a number of our partners that are part of the CPP, you know, take these on and uh, and support us and also demonstrate what's possible. For example, with PAC Global, they've been uh, offering the training in collaboration with us for delivering the GDR, um, you know, technical knowledge and developing new training modules and supporting kind of our broader partners on that as well as their own network. Um, we've also got alignment with other groups like Circular Materials, who's helping uh, get their their uh, members at that pro aligned around the GDRs. We've seen companies like Loblaw and Canadian Tire really embrace embrace this as well, not just within their own portfolios, but also influencing kind of upstream by providing training to their suppliers and vendors to align with the GDRs. So that's kind of a high level overview. If you go to the next slide, my contact information is there and I welcome any questions or uh, you wanna reach out, feel free to, to get in touch. Um, and if I may, Andrew, just put in one final plug for the last slide, which is that uh, the Canada Plastics Pact, along with many others from across Canada, and not just in the plastic space, but more broadly, will be participating in the Canadian Circular Economy Summit in uh, Montreal this April, and an opportunity to really um, get further alignment and dig deeper into some of the, the technical challenges and opportunity areas in packaging, but more broadly to advance uh, the circular economy in Canada, which uh, we're involved in helping to plan, and the CPP partners will be hosting their partner summit there. So welcome you to reach out if you have questions about either the summit or the work that we're doing at the CPP. Thanks, Paul. That's uh, that that was that was perfect. I mean, give it, I think everybody uh, a good feeling that, you know, the 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 foundation that, you know, we turn to to help build this, um, you know, has a lot of people who have adopted it. Um, and, you know, given that a lot of the people who are involved in this call uh, do get involved in other things other than plastic. I think, you know, I strongly encourage you folks to to reach out to that. And I've actually put a link in the chat, if anybody can see the chat, uh, for the uh, for the CPP as well. So if you're interested in getting more more details about that. So let's get into uh, let's get into the actual roadmap. And um, just for everybody's benefit, um, I'll be opening up the microphones for everybody so that, you know, you don't have to type in uh, your questions. If you do have any, you'll be able to talk to them. Um, but you'll also be at the end of this receiving a PDF of this roadmap as well as the presentation. Um, so, you know, you don't have to take notes and you can reference the, the recording or the actual um, virtual copies. Um, the options that we're presenting here are not mutually exclusive. So it's possible to end up adopting multiple elements um, of any one, any one of those elements into your solution. And um, this is, you know, at a at a high level, virtually all of all of the proposals and the options that we're we're presenting to folks. Um, so let's let's get into this. And and the first one is is pretty simple, straightforward, and that's just to you know, as an option, as a potential practice, if it's possible to virtually eliminate all packaging entirely, whether you're using envelopes, um, just you know. I use use things like postcards in the view of that, um, you know, create a means or a mechanism that, you know, gets away from having to end up utilizing packaging. Um, 
fairly commonplace practice. I mean, I, this is just the stuff that I ended up getting in my mailbox today. No plastic on any of these pieces. Um, and I can see from, you know, the people who are participating in this that there's, you know, one one group or one member here who's actually transitioned um, into, you know, almost virtually this entire solution and will be, you know, hosting their um, their their case study shortly um you know ultimately it reduces the amount of waste produced and it ends up supporting you know elements of the circular economy you know one of those foundational elements there is is that if you don't have to produce something you're already you know better because you know the act of product producing something you know uses energy uses resources um that you might not necessarily have to use so you know and these are not hierarchical i mean we wanted to to, to position these solutions um where you know you know, everybody could find a spot somewhere that they could, you know, adopt a practice. So that's that's the first option. The second option is to transition, you know, from using plastics and replacing them with paper. Um, as then Eleanor referred uh, to it before, there's a case study that's up on our site right now with DRMG. Um, again, it's a common practice. Um, you know, in this particular case, the primary advantage that you're being provided is um, you're not contaminating either the paper waste stream or the plastics waste stream where inevitably what ends up happening when consumers receive this they don't bother taking the action of separating the materials from each other and that's key here right is that you know if they choose to simply throw everything into the recycling bin chances are that what's going to end up happening is, is that you're either going to contaminate the paper waste stream um, with the plastics that are being used there or vice versa. Um, you're contaminating the plastics waste stream with the paper that's being used there. So, you know, that's a viable option. I know I've had some conversations with some of our members um, who have either gone down this path already or are investigating means by which to actually do that. And as I alluded to, DRMG is the, you know, a case study that we've got there. Um, Eleanor uh, highlighted that. The other case study that we've um, put up there is actually from SupremeX, um, where they have a solution that would enable people who are sending out publications um, or, um, for that matter, potential transactional mail um, that, you know, maybe, you know, high value, and that's a, a paper mailer. Um, so there's, there's, you know, another case study that you could potentially end up looking at. Um, Third option is to simply reduce the amount of plastics that you're using through solutions like either down gauging, so using a thinner plastic material, or reducing, if at all possible, the size of the envelope or the packaging that you were using there. Ultimately, what that benefits you is, you know, benefits, you know, the 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 the, the direction that we're going in is just source reduction. You're going to use less material. And it's something that's been, you know, quite readily adopted um, within the packaging industry um, as far as flexible films go. Um, to use thinner materials. It's definitely been the case in terms of the B2B world where people have uh, migrated for instance, using stretch film um, or shrink film even, um, and have been able to, to migrate down to thinner gauge materials. Um, so you still get to use plastic, you just use less of it because the material is, is, is thinner. So the other thing that we're recommending um, as an option is the, to reduce the use of virgin plastics um, and trying wherever possible to be able to, you know, ideally incorporate post-consumer recycled content. Um, so what, you know, this gets at is, is that, you know, we reduce the amount of resources deleted because you're actually um, utilizing materials that have already been utilized in some way, shape or form and are simply recycled. Um, as a result, it hopefully ends up reducing the amount of material in landfills. Um, and, you know, by requesting recycled material, um, we're driving and trying to build a market for that recycled content um, through demand. Um, the other, the other thing that you know, as a, as an industry that we're in a in a pretty good position to be able to adopt this, um, in is that for the most part, um, we don't have some of the constraints that, for instance, food packagers are utilizing, um, where there is you know a direct 
food contact application. So it's possible to end up using, you know, post-consumer recycled content without having to incur some of the challenges of being able to, you know, source post-consumer recycled content that's been designed and adapted for use in direct food contact um, applications. So if you're, you know, if there's, there's an ability to be able to source materials like this, this is a perfect application for it. Um, in line with the GDR, you know, we're encouraging people to use wherever possible um, mono materials or mono material laminates um, with a specific preference for low density polyethylene or high density polyethylene, although you know polypropylene will work in this case as well. And in in, in this case, what we're what we're referencing is um, trying to discourage people from using um, multi-material laminates. Um, like, you know, metallicized materials um, that might contain like a hologram or something like that, or foils, for instance, in their packaging. And the primary driver behind that is, is that those kinds of multiple material structures um, make it difficult for them to end up being recycled through mechanical recycling, which is you know, by far uh, the most commonplace means by which to actually recycle mar recycle materials um, in the North American market and definitely the case in Canada. Um, I've also included a, um, a link in the deck, which you'll end up receiving after this session, to some work um, that the CPP has ended up doing um, around uh, mono materials. And Paul, I'm just going to tap you on the shoulder if you can talk about that a little bit. Um, the, the guidance document that the CPP has put out there so that people kind of know what they'll get into before they click on that link? Sure, yeah, I'm happy to uh, share that link as well. But it's essentially a document we put together aligned with the, the Golden Design Rules, um, and it provides sort of uh, considerations for brand owners, um, you know, consumer good products, uh, manufacturers, retailers with their own brands, et cetera and their own products to consider when they're looking to move their flexible packaging from sort of complex multi-material um, structures to more mono material. And by mono material, we refer to sort of 90% plus um, polyethylene or polypropylene with a preference for polyethylene and that the, the barrier layers, et cetera, have to be, you know, relatively in and meet the sort of guidelines for recycling guidelines. And this is done also in collaboration with the Association for Plastic Recyclers or APR um, and their technical guidance. But essentially it's a, a number of uh, you know, uh, considerations as you're looking to make that transition to more monomaterial, what questions you should be asking yourself um, about your package, about your product, about your marketing, um, and about uh, you know the in the way it would be recycled at end of life, um, and also sort of give some some considerations for the technical barrier layers and and other uh, factors around around uh, flexible materials. So uh, I'll share the link. We've also just been hosting a series of technical workshops on converting all different types of uh, product packaging, whether it's non-food or food-related categories like um, shelf shelf stable or uh, you know, refrigerated, et cetera, into modern material and, and converting those um, technical workshops and case studies into an appendix for the Pathways to Mono Material Guide. So um, cool. not maybe all totally relevant to your space in the sustainable mail area, but um, certainly some some good information if uh, if people also have a broader portfolio of packaging they're looking to move to, to mono material. Thanks. And and just, just to highlight another thing there too, actually, we've got a great case study that we were able to create um, with Rob Linden and, at Sample Source, um, highlighting you know how he ends up using uh, mono materials um, to distribute samples uh, to, to to consumers, um, which you know is a, a particularly sensitive area because there are some constraints around odor control, et cetera, et cetera, and obviously containment um, when those items end up getting distributed. So it's 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 key to understanding the ability to to, to transition and how people can end up using mono. Um, um, layer or uh, multi-laminate 
but it's, you know, common materials um, in those kinds of solutions. Paul, I'm going to keep you um, keep you on because there's a, probably a couple other areas that we're going to probably tap you on the shoulder with as we go through this. Role. Sure, I did so, try to share the link, but I, I also don't seem to be able to share it with the broader attendees. Just the uh, I, I'll, I'll, I'll share it and it's in the it's in the deck that will go out like this green bit. If somebody clicks on it, you'll be able to actually go directly to that document. I want to clarify too. So sometimes this can be confusing uh, for for people. Uh, when we say mono material, it doesn't mean mono layer, and so that's I think an important um, differentiation. It just means that it's from predominantly a single resin. Um, when we say mono material, so you can still have multiple layers, um, obviously, but, but uh, you know, uh, uh, just a single um, resin. You know, within the within those guidelines. Yeah, thanks. That actually that that that's that's great because that actually came out in some conversations um, through the folks we vetted stuff out in the original roadmap that we created. There needed to be a language change that ultimately resulted in this. So thanks for pointing that out. Um, then the other thing is, is that you know we're encouraging people you know to 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 optimally optimally um, remove. Um, you know, items that are difficult to recycle or problematic materials. And the two items that, you know, we highlighted here specifically um, are, you know, black materials um, and oxodegradables. Um, the issue with, you know, black materials is, you know, they're, they're, they provide challenges um, in the sorting process during recycling, but they also degrade the value of the materials ultimately um, when they are recycled. You really can't do anything um, with black plastic other than to manufacture more black plastic, which just leads to, you know, ultimately the the kind of stuff that get it gets recycled into being can liners or garbage can, you know, garbage bags. Um, the the other piece um you know we we're focused on is, is that to to encourage people not to end up using oxodegradable additives um in the plastics that they're utilizing i know that in you know some of the consultations that we had um through the process people highlighted this as being a potential solution and you know we were just saying hey this this isn't really the solution that you know you've been led to believe um the challenge is is that you know left out in the open environment um those materials were fragmented in the microplastics which just you know compounds the problem it doesn't end up resolving the, you know the issue that you're trying to end up fixing um and and it can contaminate other plastics when it's introduced in the recycling stream paul there's some effort at the cpp right now to work on compostables um, which is a separate stream of materials we didn't incorporate that into this um because quite frankly i think that it's still early on in that process and i didn't want to complicate matters but can you just talk a little bit about you know some of the work that's being done there sure yeah we had a compostables working group who uh worked on some guidance as well it's actually two-part guidance the first part is uh being published uh you know in the very near term and it's essentially a current state analysis of the the you know compostable packaging and the infrastructure or the infrastructure gaps that exist in this space across Canada right now. The second part is more of the guidance on how uh, we feel CPP partners should be thinking about the converting um, plastic packaging to compostable packaging in the near term, given the uh, the challenges with some of the infrastructure and largely that's around um, the risk of contamination. So if uh, you know a compostable package gets put in the the wrong bin and ends up with say a plastic uh, package it can often contaminate um, the bin and vice versa if uh, the wrong plastic package gets put into the compost bin and it doesn't biodegrade uh, within the timelines um, that are compost within the timelines then um, we run into problems with the infrastructure uh, downstream so at this time i think the some of the cpp guidance especially around uh, film and flexible packaging has been to uh, avoid transitioning from pl uh, plastic flexible packaging or films to compostable um, until uh, some of those issues around contamination have been sorted out because you just end up um, decreasing the value for all of these streams if uh, if you get that contamination in there thank you and then lastly um and and I've included a couple of examples here, and I'll talk to those examples shortly. But um, you know, whenever possible, um, you know, provide some indication somewhere, um, you know, for for consumers to separate the materials. So, in other words, if it's you know 
a bunch of paper included in a plastic mailer or a plastic envelope, segregate those two materials possible before you actually put them into either, you know, if you have a dual stream recycling program where you have a black box and a blue box, you know, put them into the relevant containers or verify whether or not, you know, the municipality that you're dealing with is, is receiving flexibles. Um, but just to segregate them, even if you're in a single stream system, um, you know, you're you're going to ensure that, you know, the, the, the chances of the paper being recycled improves, you know, hopefully the chances of the plastics being recycled ends up improving. Um, there are, you know, mechanisms out there, there are schemes that are out there, you know, that that anybody can end up adopting, you know, I've highlighted here the how to recycle um, label. Um, which is hosted by the Sustainable Packaging Coalition down in the U.S. This is actually a for-pay mechanism. So if you choose to adopt this, um, you're going to be in a situation where you're going to have to end up paying to utilize that label. But even then, I mean, it's just, you know, as simple to, you know, potentially just use some language that simply says, you know, please separate the paper contents from the plastic contents when placing this in your recycling container. So as I as I said, um, we're going to be sending this out to everybody, um, both the roadmap and uh, the the PDF of the presentation. If you want to go look at um, the case studies and the roadmap itself, um, you're welcome to do that via the link pre pre presented here. Um, we're um, but and and one of the takeaways, you know, as we go through this process, is that we're going to continue, you know, appending more. Uh, case studies. Um, you know, there's there's one that we're you know just waiting to publish right now, simply because we just need to sign off um, on some data that's cited in the in the article itself, and hopefully that'll be available in the next couple of weeks. Um, and what I'm going to do now is I am going to allow everybody on the call to talk, um, and if you've got any questions, um, you know that's the way to do it. Um, and uh, instead of using the chat. So, sorry, I'm hoping I'm getting through everybody here. Yeah, I think I've done it if you can't talk. So does anybody have any questions? Just turn your mic on, blurt them out and we'll try to answer them. Don't be shy. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that the unmute worked. So confirm. That's it? That's all you wanted to do? <laughs> yeah, well, actually, one thing, uh, Andrew, and, and just uh, I, I like at the end, you have, uh, you have a little bit of info around the OXO de degradable, which was a big thing 15 years ago where everybody came up with an, uh, an option on this and it shows that, that that was not the right option. And so it's important to always stay close to technology and, and make sure we have friends who understand the technology that are in our, in our close circle because technology keeps changing. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Stefan. I, I, I also encourage everybody to, you know, engage with, you know, either ourselves, you know, or folks at the CPP, um, whenever possible, because I mean, it's through that consultative process that, where, you know, you, you, you have the ability to be able to, you know, uh, find out what everybody's doing and rather than going down, you know, a potential path um, that might be an evolutionary dead end. Right. So that's, that's, that's key here. So, you know, we're trying to do our best. We're also consulting with other folks who are, you know, in a similar position. And, and I think that's key. We got a hand up here. Um, and uh, go ahead. Can you can you talk? Can you turn your mic on, Lisa? Uh, hello. Yes. Hi there, uh, Ali Reza. Uh, hello. Yes, yep, we can hear you. My name is Ali Reza. Uh, thank you very much for your uh, presentation. I have a question about the uh, the effect of printing on the recyclability of the uh, plastic packaging. Is there any uh, uh, effect, uh, uh, is there 
the possibility that uh, the printing material could affect on the recycle uh, recycling of the uh, plastic packaging that's that's a really good question um and i don't think i've got an answer to that but um we have some really smart people on this call who i know are involved in the process so um maybe i'm going to ask Paul, uh, Shell David, you're on the call here. Um, can you guys, you know, take a, take a stab at this? I mean, Shell David, you're involved very much at the tail end of things. Do you have any insight around that? Sure. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'd say yes and no. Um, yes, obviously, um, if you're trying to uh, recycle the plastics back into film, for example, that's also clear. And reusable and reused as clear film. Obviously, the print um, and the inks will affect the color and the clarity of the film that's recycled. So I'd say in that case, yes. Um, in the case where um, you are not as worried about clarity or color, then the print um, will not be a problem. Uh, but it's likely that the resins that come out are going to be a grayer, grayish, greenish color. Um, which can then be used in other um, end markets. Um, but yes, so if, if your plan is to try to go film to film, um, ideally you would have no printing whatsoever. Thanks. Yes, Sita. Thank you very much. Any other questions, observations, Andrew, criticisms? Down. I, can I add something to that, Andrew? Of course. Uh, especially when we're thinking about how to integrate recycled content into packaging or film. Um, I think uh, one quote or comment I've heard in the past is as we kind of move to more of a circular plastics economy or a circular economy for plastics, um, you know, the manufacturer, the brand owner or whoever's creating the packaging is actually their own supplier of PCR. Uh, in other words, you know, whatever you put into your package or whatever printing or labeling or whatever you put on it, if, if it's going to tint it to, you know, a different gray or a darker color, et cetera, um, then you should expect to get that back and be willing to work with that kind of material back in your package. If you want it to be clear, then don't put printing on it or find another way to, to do that so that you're not uh, contaminating the PCR stream uh, and trying to keep it as clean as possible. That's a good point. Well, um, unless we're good, anybody, any other questions or people overcome their shyness? Um, well, oh, no, Venice, we've got a question. You don't need to raise your hands. Just blurt them out. Oh, hi, Andrew. Yeah, I do have a comment. This has been a very interesting um, presentation uh, for me. I, I find all of this quite fascinating. On one of the slides of the plastic roadmap, the po first point is eliminate all plastic, all packaging entirely. And I'm just wondering when I saw that, it sort of raised a little bit of a, you know, uh, a flag for me. How would the, um, you know, how would you approach retailers that are using packaging for all of their online, um, you know, shipments? I'm wondering if that's applying here or, or do you have a comment on that yeah so that's a that, that that's a good question so you know the purposes of this of this of this roadmap and this guidance was really focused on 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 mail rather than parcels mm. right so i mean that's that's key there um so we obviously had to end up differentiating between that um but as as you well know and i mean there's somebody on this call who you know is 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 part of a of a case study that we're going to end up publishing, um, there there is an ability to end up transitioning away from using, um, you know, plastics towards something where there is no packaging whatsoever. And if there's any examples of that, I mean, I've got it in my hand. This is the stuff that came in in my mailbox today, and you know, I'm I'm by no means you know individual who gets targeted by a lot of stuff um in terms of demographics but there's there isn't any plastic in any of this stuff so you know it's it's a fairly common practice already but you know the the focus of this was very much on you know transactional mail um printing and publications um direct mail um and and that and that piece so everything that doesn't end up getting um 
covered off on by the 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 move that uh, Canada Post ended up making in the neighborhood mail mm -hmm. space. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? No. Okay. So um, I'm just going to, you know, put the closing comments here. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Eleanor. Thank you, Shell David, and chiming chiming in on that where you're able to help. Um, we will be sending all of this stuff out to folks in the in email format, so you'll be able to get the PDF of the roadmap and the presentation as well. Um, I encourage you to you know check us out if you're already not a member to end up signing up with us, um, and also encourage you to um, check out the Canada Plastics Pack. We've gained a lot um, from our participation and collaboration with them, both from a networking perspective, but also from a knowledge base point of view. Um, and I strongly encourage um, looking at them. And um, stay tuned because we're going to be, you know, sending invitations to our next session in the coming weeks. Thank you, everyone.